like this right here Makes me feel free It's got that, uh, you know, that bomb Welcome to the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park, folks. I am the tank commander, as you can see. I'm in my uniform here. I've come down here today in some pretty drizzly weather, and we are going to be discussing a very interesting subject. What we are going to be discussing is this ship behind me. This ship here is the USS The Sullivan's DD-537. It is one of four Fletcher-class destroyers left in the world. There are three in the United States and one in Greece. But the reason why I am filming this video today is not to encourage you guys to come here or anything. The reason why I am doing this video is for a very specific matter. And I'll explain it to you as we go along, okay? So as we come along the hall, as we see, USS The Sullivans, as you can see, is DD-537. What that means is this was the 537th destroyer built by the United States Navy. And, as you probably never knew, and this is probably only for Navy historians and people who play World of Warships and stuff like that. A Fletcher-class destroyer was the most numerous class of destroyer built by any nation. 175 of them were built. And the Sullivans happens to be one of them. It is one of only four surviving Sol uh, Fletcher's class destroyers left in the world. And the others include the following. USS Kazan Young, DD-793. USS Kidd, DD-661. And HS Velos, ex-USS Caret, DD-581. As we come along the hull of the Sullivans, as you can see, she's a pretty big destroyer. Fletcher class destroyers were over 300 feet long, and they were pretty fast too. They could go up to more than 30 knots, and that's in naval terminology. I'll put the speed up right now. So as you can see, if you look up there on the funnel behind me, that's a shamrock. The reason why is because Sullivan is an Irish surname. But that's not the reason why I'm here. Let's go aboard and I'll explain it to you, okay? Now then, we are inside the Sullivans now. The reason why I brought this here, the reason why that shamrock is there, is for the portraits you see behind me. The portraits you see behind me are the individuals that this ship was built after. These are the five Sullivan brothers. Madison. Joseph. George. Francis. And the youngest, Albert. And they were an Irish family, in case you're ordering, from Waterloo, Iowa. The reason why I am discussing this is because several seasons ago, during the winter here in western New York, a terrible ice storm came in and ice ruptured the hull of the Sullivans. That's right, the Sullivans is flooded. My division that was here, the Sullivans Division of the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps, had dress white uniforms down in that area where it flooded. We lost a lot of them. I do not recollect the number that was exactly said by my executive officer. I could probably ask him at some point. But this is what I'm trying to get at. Weeks ago, the granddaughter of the Sullivan brothers, Miss Kelly Sullivan, who is the granddaughter of the youngest, Albert, came to Buffalo and started a donation. A donation to help rebuild the Sullivans' hull to patch it up. Well, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we can go a lot further. I'll show you.
As we come out here on the main deck, you can see behind me, this is one of the main armaments of a Fletcher class destroyer. This is a 127 millimeter 38 caliber gun. What does that mean? That means that this gun is 127 millimeters or five inches barrel diameter. 38 calibers is 38 calibers long. That means the length of the barrel is 38 times the diameter of the gun. This ship originally had five of them. Of course, in the late 60s, early 70s, this ship was converted and it lost its fifth turret. And it also lost its quintuple launch torpedo tubes. But you know something? That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. That doesn't necessarily mean it's out of date or anything. This ship has seen a lot of action, including shooting down kamikazes in the Pacific. So, I heard my umbrella fall there. So, what am I thinking about this? I'm thinking we can go further. What I'm thinking is let's not just fix the Sullivans' hull. Let's go even further. There are several fully operational museum ships in the United States, and they are as follows. The SS Jeremiah O'Brien, a Liberty ship. The SS John W. Brown, another Liberty ship. The SS American Victory, a Victory class cargo vessel. The SS Lane Victory, another Victory class cargo vessel. USS Potomac, AG-25, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's presidential yacht. USS Constitution, aka Old Ironsides, a frigate built for the United States Navy in 1797. And one of the most famous warships still afloat from the War of 1812, the U.S. Brig Niagara, built in 1813, saw service in the Battle of Lake Erie. Now, those all ships that I mentioned, they all have their own qualities. But let's think of something. First off, none of them is a Fletcher-class destroyer. And two, none of those are on the Great Lakes, which is where this is. This is the only inland port naval park that there is. And I think that this ship should get a fighting chance. Now, speaking of fighting chances, I'm actually standing in the barbette below turret number two in here. Let's uh, take a look up. Up in there is where the turret is. And these are the weapon loading racks right here. And of course, we've got some deactivated slash dummy shells here. But that's what I'm thinking. We should restore the USS The Sullivans to a fully operational museum ship. As we come below decks, we look and see just how cramped it is in here. Navy ships were not meant for the tallest individuals. As you can look, these are some of the officers' berthings. As you see here, nice mannequin. <laughs> Out here. In Navy terminology, this is called a scuttlebutt. There are two types of scuttlebutts. That's my umbrella. This scuttlebutt, which you drink out of, and there's also a scuttlebutt, which is gossip. You come and walk through. You can take a look at some of these other birthings right here. See? You had to fit birthings anywhere you could fit them in these ships. And think about that. Taking this on an actual running tour. A running tour as an operational museum ship. Capable of traveling across the Great Lakes, being the only one of its kind. And we are going down now. You gotta make sure you watch your heads in these tight spaces. And here, more birthings. As you can see, there is not a lot of space. This follows the entire... This, well, not the entire, mostly, but it follows the shape of the ship's hull. Hey, take a look. All these pictures. This is what the glory days of the Navy were. These were the fun times, and I'm sure a lot of veterans could probably agree. I'm sitting down in the mess hall now. I used to eat in here when I was on here. I know, I'll take this off. Pardon my ridiculous hair. You look behind me, 
That is a picture of the Essex-class carrier USS Bunker Hill. In 1945, that aircraft carrier was struck by kamikazes. This ship was one of those ships to respond to that. This mess hall would have been filled with bodies, wounded, dying, dead. They had to be evacuated from the Bunker Hill. Yet the Bunker Hill did survive, but the Sullivans was one of those first ships to be there. And I gotta say, we should be there for the Sullivans. I'm doing this in honor to help Miss Kelly Sullivan, who I actually did talk to over Messenger via Facebook. You may think this idea may be aud audacious. Well, let me tell you, sometimes you have to be audacious in order to get things done. And we're going to continue on this now. All right, let's go. A little known fact here. See that right there? Navy folks, you should know, that's an Arleigh Burke class destroyer. That's the second USS the Sullivans that was built after this in the and launched in the 1990s. Kelly Sullivan had the honor to christen that ship just like the Sullivan brothers' mother, her great-grandmother, christened this ship, along with President Roosevelt. You gotta think just how heavy emotions are in an event like that. But well, there's a lot more to it, and we gotta move. I'm up out on the upper decks now, and as you see behind me, this is turret number two. This is one of the biggest thing... I'll be honest, forgive me for saying this, I just saw what was either an otter or a muskrat just dive in the water down there. Anyway, we get back to this. If we were to completely restore the USS the Sullivans to fully running order, the most important part would be to restore these guns. Meaning, they would have to have the same condition as the secondary guns on the battleship New Jersey, which is, in, which is moored in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, slash Camden, New Jersey. Those guns have the potential to fire blank rounds, which I have heard fire myself. But think about this. How about having a fully operational museum ship touring the lakes and having these big guns fire? Think about that. We could have this entire ship have a life and have a soul. Now, of course, as many of you probably have either realized or not realized, this ship was built after the Sullivan Brothers. And I will be honest, I should say that if you're a believer in the paranormal, I guarantee their ghosts are here because I have seen them. Those who uh, don't think ghosts are real, I'm sorry, you have your opinions, but we're gonna get away from that. As we walk past, we see some of the interesting little hedgehog launchers. These things were super effective against submarines. They did a very good job at restoring them, but you know something? Like I said, if we could go further, even have these, like, say, have ones made out of heavy foam or something, they could have the spigot, and they could launch them off the side if this thing was fully restored. Just imagine that. Having this thing, again, fully restored. Fully restored. And actually have it up and moving again. Just imagine that. And if you're familiar with this, this is a Morse code lamp. And if one thing that I learned from watching war movies is there's one very important piece of Morse code that you should know, and I'll show you. I can't extend this anymore, but I'll do my best to get representation. All right, you should know this. I'm sorry, the thing's not on. But if you didn't catch it, I did three short bursts and then a long burst. That is the letter V. What they did was, this was from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. If any of you have seen the movie The Longest Day, produced by Daryl F. Zanuck, produced in 1962, the V for victory was a common symbol that would have been used by everybody. So, 
Let's see. Full speed, it would look, it would look like this. There are areas on this ship that have been restored, but like I said, we need to go beyond the repairs of the hull and we need to do something audacious. Buffalonians who are watching this understand that all this, we've got to get moving because you know something? If we don't take the first step, that first step will never be taken. And now we are in the main bridge of the Sullivans. This is the upper bridge. If you look through these windows, I'm sorry about the glare, you can see the inside of the bridge. Just picture this. Picture that we could get this ship fully operational and you could just get the nice view from here. In fact, let me turn around and take a look. Look at that absolutely beautiful view. Repair the hull, maybe one step, but like I said, again and again, let's take it a step further. Stepping down the ladder now, you guys got a good chance to see this. I can get the right angle on it. You see up there? I'm not sure if you could or not, but up there is the shamrock. If any of you had never known, the Sullivan Brothers had a motto. We stay together. And you know something? They're right. Family have to stay together, no matter what the odds. Whether you're near or far, we all have to stick together at some point. Now, we're coming down here, and these areas here were actually where the quintuple launch torpedo tubes used to be but after the remodeling this is what we have here look at these folks <laughs> say hello to the Bofors 40 millimeter dual mount anti-aircraft gun now, I'm not sure which model this is I know the most recent model is the mark 7 let's see uh, I'm not seeing on the information sheet, but I want to guess that this is probably the Mark 7, I believe. That's what I want to guess. And of course, there's a second one over there. And now as we come back here, past the second funnel, here are the more modern torpedo tubes. If you actually look, you look right there at that circular plate. That's where the quintuple launcher of the torpedoes used to be. But now they have these triple mounts on both sides. Because you know something? In the modern day, we don't necessarily need these things, the quintuple launchers. Of course, I'm sure a lot of our fans from World of Warships can agree. Because frankly, I play the... The highest one I have is the USS Sims. That thing's fun, and that thing's got a nice torpedo launch as well. But again, we do all this restoration work, and yet it still sits here. Like I said, we can go further than this. Because you know something? We should care about these historical icons. Whether they are for our hometown, that I'm from, from Buffalo, or of other places. We have to get these ships to move. Oh, anybody take a look at this? <laughs> you see that? That's a 76.2 millimeter, uh, I think it's actually a, it might be a dummy or deactivated. Let me take a look underneath. Let's see. Let's look. Huh. Looks like it's a dummy. Now you're probably wondering why that is. Why is there a three inch round on a ship that has five inch guns? Oh, hang on a second. Gotta open the umbrella because rain's starting to come. Sorry about this. That's better. I'm gonna come past the five inch gun uh, here at the back. And if you look, you look up there, those are the three inch guns. 
those are the 76.2 millimeter and those are the I'm pretty sure those are the mark 22s if I remember correctly they're multi-purpose guns and as you'll see as we go below there's also some other uh, interesting anti-aircraft guns here as well again more restoration means we can do a lot more stuff with this ship and I'm sure a lot of you fans can agree so let's get moving along here folks I might have a better view of the shamrock for you pardon my umbrella let's see if we can get it there she is that's the shamrock trying to maneuver here with an umbrella is pretty tricky but we're gonna get going below now and you're gonna see some of the things that are going to be most crucial to the restoration of this vessel so let's get a move on All right, folks, we're now stepping down into the one of the main areas that would be crucial to the restoration of this ship. We are in the main engine and boiler rooms. And believe it or not, the picture that you just saw is of a veteran of the USS the Sullivans. Petty Officer Third Class slash Bosun's, uh, excuse me, not Bosun's, a uh, boiler technician Third Class, Dennis Madigan who was on this ship during the Vietnam War. And he said, even being in this room, there was nowhere on board this ship that you could not hear the main guns of this ship going off. And as you know, with any ship restoration, this is the biggest part. This is basically the piece de resistance of the operation, the coup de grace of it. You just look here, you take a look at this. You can see inside the steam drum right there. If this ship would be restored to fully operational use, this would be the first thing that would have to be fixed up. I will be honest, probably a lot of these old things would have to get torn out. Unless they can get them fully operational again, that would take a lot, more, that would take a lot of time. In fact, both things would take a lot of time. But you know something? When you take the time and you put in the detail, you shouldn't have to worry. Let's continue. If you listen in this part of it, this is where the engines are. As you can see over there, it says a stern turbine right there. And then high pressure turbine on that one. You can imagine just how loud it would get down here. But as, uh, as Mr. Madigan said, there's nothing on board this. There's no place on board this ship that you cannot hear those main guns going off. Both of these would be crucial in the restoration of this ship. And I cannot express enough that people help with these donations. And here's an interesting sight for you folks. Check these out. This is a depth charge launcher. This was put in not too many years ago, but as you can see, take a look at the difference in these depth charges, okay? These ones right here are the Mark VI. These were the regular cylindrical drums. If any of you have seen like some of those old submarine movies, you'd be seeing a lot of these ones. And like I said, these are the Mark VI. Where's, uh... It's funny, oh yes. Now let me show you this real quick. See this picture of this teardrop here? You take a look again. That's this depth charge. This is the Mark IX. This is a teardrop depth charge, which would go down a lot quicker than the cylindrical drums. As you can see how it is rounded, little you could say, uh, <laughs> like the mighty jingles, it looks like a bum. And if I remember correctly from the Gamescom footage, as uh, Rita said, uh, get the lady riding the torpedo. It's like, oh wait, that's a bum. So you can see how that literally looks like a bomb. It's a depth bomb. And as you look behind me, ladies and gentlemen, welcome the 20 millimeter Orlikan. This is a Swedish 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. What I watched, if any of you have seen the show Dogfights, the way it would work with a destroyer is, when you are dealing with something like a kamikaze, you would first start with those big five inch guns 
that are radar directed, barking at the enemy when they're far out. Then you come closer in, those 40 millimeter Bofors guns up there started uh, shooting away at them. And then when they got even closer, you would have the 20 millimeters rattling at them. These would provide fierce rates of fire. Like again, with war, not only comes precision, also comes luck. So, oh, you guys want to get an interesting view? Take a look. I'll let you have a look down the, the site. Isn't that cool? So, as we take a look, now I'll explain about some other things, but keep walking through. Now this area here, for any of you paranormal people, when I walked in here years ago for the first time, I heard footsteps in here. I had the feeling that that was George Sullivan, because you know something? After I walked through here, as I walked out of that washroom, as you can see, we're under another turret barbette. It was actually down there that I came back and looked up here and I saw a shadow dart away. I'm convinced that that was George Sullivan, the oldest of the brothers. So Kelly Sullivan, if you ever get a chance to watch this video, I believe that they're still here. So let's go down, shall we? Right, now we come down here. This is where all the men slept. This is the birthing. And I can pick out this specific berth that I slept in. You look behind the stairs, I slept in that berth right there. And I gotta tell you, these, ugh, as you can see, these are not meant for comfort at all. Because if you look, these things are stacked three high. So as you can probably guess, you would not want to be the one to be sleeping on this top bunk. Especially if you're under some of this. Because if you get jerked awake, you just might as well bang your head. And as you look back here, got an aft steering compartment. We're going to be heading back up on deck now. Now coming up, we are up here on the fan tail, which is the very rear of the ship. And as you can see, we got another 20 millimeter Orlikin here. And we got a depth charge rack here. Again, these are the old Mark Sixes. Now, the reason why we are going up is because, oh, here, I forgot. In case you guys wanted to see, I'll take you inside this gun turret here. Just gotta be careful. <sighs> take a look at this. Look at this giant breach and look at that huge shell. If I remember correctly, I think each of these shells weighs at least 55 pounds. And as you can see, they came up these chutes here. And as you can see, there's a dummy round right there. These shells could be fired as fast as these men could load them. If any of you have heard about the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the USS Johnston, which was another Fletcher-class destroyer, in, I think, what was it? Probably like... 10 minutes, this, that ship got off 200 shots in 10 minutes from its five five inch guns. But we're not worried about that right now because I gotta explain something to you guys. That is also another crucial part of helping the Sullivans. The reason in order to get the Sullivans out, if we were to ever get her fully operational again, is we gotta do something to that big girl right there. That big girl right there is the USS Little Rock. What's so special about the USS Little Rock? Here's a question for you. Have any of you who play World of Warships watched Naval Legends? Have you seen the episode of the Cleveland-class cruisers? The Little Rock is the last surviving example of the Cleveland-class cruisers, the most numerous cruisers ever built. During World War II, she was known as CL-92. 
She was the 92nd cruiser built for the United States, and CL stands for Cruiser Light. In the late 50s, she was refitted and she became what is known as a Galveston class cruiser. Now the Galveston was actually originally a Cleveland class cruiser, but it got an upgrade of having an incredible ability to launch something incredible off it. But before we get to that, what do we have to do to the Little Rock, you're wondering? Well, the Little Rock was officially brought here in 1977-76. That winter, we had a terrible storm here known as the Blizzard of 77 hit. And I was told by a Little Rock veteran who was from Detroit who came here for this. The water got up into the plumbing of the poor Little Rock and it froze in the plumbing and broke it. That Little Rock veteran said if it wasn't for the Buffalo Fire Department, the Little Rock would have toppled over into the Buffalo River. That ship was on the verge of capsizing. Nowadays, she is basically sitting on the bottom of the river. If we were to get the Sullivans out, we would have to refloat the Little Rock. And you know something? That's something we should do. She should not be just sitting there on the bottom, having her insides rot away like that. That is not a worthy fate of the last Cleveland-class cruiser left in existence. That's right. Again, she is the last of her kind. The very last, folks. Is that not sad? The reason why the USS Little Rock was reclassified in the late 1950s as a Galveston-class cruiser is because of what's behind me. That is a twin launcher for Talos missiles. And if we take a look... Behind that door, go through that hatch, that's the missile preparation bay. But we're not gonna show you that because that's not as important as the conversation we're having right now. And this right here, folks, this is the birthing on the bigger ship. Of course, you know it as the USS Little Rock. This is the exact bunk that I slept in. And I gotta tell you, it was really fun. You'll have to know, when it comes to these ships, they weren't built for comfort a lot, okay? Especially for the enlisted men. Frankly, between you and me, I slept like a rock, so I didn't really care. It didn't really affect me. But you can imagine just how much goes into these ships, including the places where sailors eat, sleep, shower, do a lot of that stuff. But you know something? We all gotta play our part. We gotta help them. Here's just a brief showing of what exactly the USS Little Rock used to look like, folks. We look at these two models. As we come in, as you come across, this is what the Little Rock was originally. CL-92. As you can see, it had 12 6-inch guns and it had 20 5-inch guns. Then it was converted into this. As you can see, it was converted into a Galveston class. Now the reason is because what the difference is, the Galveston was a Cleveland class cruiser. However, it was the first to mount those Talos missile launchers, so it basically became a class of its own. However, the thing that basically remained the same with the Little Rock when it was converted was the main hull. I'm sorry, it's a little bit loud in here. The hull is the same as the, its original Cleveland class look, 
and the other two are its front 6 inch and front 5 inch guns. So as you can probably tell, she is in fact the last of her kind. Pretty incredible, huh? So here is a look from up at the bow, folks, all right? And this is what I said. Those are two of the three things about the Little Rock that has remained the same. That is its original forward six inch triple mount turret. And above that is the dual mount five inch turret. So, as you can see, there hasn't been much that has changed. Okay, well, a lot has changed, but there's been a lot that hasn't changed with that either. And it just shows you just how much there is about this ship. And another fun fact, I had a relative who was the helmsman of this ship. Picture this. You're just driving around, piloting your, say, 2,500 pound car. You think that's hard. Think of this. This ship weighs 11,000 tons. Okay? 11,000 tons. That's a lot more than your standard sized sedan. So, yeah. Quite incredible, isn't it? And here's another look at that beautiful ship, folks. The beautiful ship that is the USS The Sullivans. One of only four Fletcher class destroyers left on Earth out of 175 that were built. You guys tell me what we should do. I think it should definitely be fully operational again, don't you? And now I'm standing in the bridge of the USS Little Rock. I'm sitting in one of the things that is known as the Admiral's Chair. And you take a look out there, you just look at that view, of course, you can probably see that it's very foggy because the winter has ended not too long ago. And a lot of the ice, if you look very carefully, is still out there in Lake Erie. But you know something? It doesn't matter. Because I'm not talking about the weather. I'm talking about these ships. And all the care that we have got to put back into them. So... We best continue. And here, folks, is the coup de grace of the USS Little Rock. This is the ship's wheel. Think about that. Decades back, my relative turned this wheel to turn this big ship. Imagine that. But we must continue. Let's keep talking. As I'm walking here along the upper works of the USS Little Rock, you gotta see, there's a lot of other restoration work that we can do on it. Oh, here. Here's a rare view of this. You take a look. You look at those flags down there. That's on the Sullivans. Sorry, I accidentally hit it. Shot down eight aircraft and bombarded two islands. And if I remember correctly, five of those eight aircraft were kamikazes. I'll probably have to read up on that, but that's away from the purpose of this video. So, we're continuing to go back down. And, I'll tell you, there's just so much that has to be said. Still. So much. Just a little side trip here. You ever wonder what I'm walking across and what I'm walking past? I'm walking on the deck of a submarine. I'm walking on the deck of a Bilal class submarine, our USS Croker. And take a look. How do you like that view of that big, beautiful gray girl? USS Little Rock. As I said, it is now CLG-4, which means Cruiser Light Guided Missile. We're now stepping down below decks now into the bowels of the submarine. 
and I'll explain to you why so many people have told me that I'd be the perfect World War II Submariner. I'll tell ya. This is why I've been known as a World War II Submariner. I'd be the perfect one. These hatches are so, so small. You look, I stand up, my head stretches about eight inches above it. This is the reason why we have what are known as headbangers and knee knockers. So what the way is to go through these hatchways is to simply go, and I'll show you, hopefully without hitting the camera, is you grab onto this aperture up here, and you jump up, and you swing through. So, as you can see, that's why everything is so short in here. In fact, I'll even have to crash down for this. Everything is so short in a submarine. That is why the shortest people were submariners. Because you had to be short. So, let's move on. <clears throat> as you can see, we're in the main war room area here. As you can see, these things are so close above our heads. Now, if we actually look, and I'll tilt this up so you guys can see. If we actually look up there, that's the periscope. Now, what is this sub's specific uh, connection with the Sullivans and the Little Rock? Back when this thing came to the Mediterranean after World War II, it actually got a periscope picture of the USS Little Rock. I'm not sure if it's in here, but I know I've seen it. And with the Sullivans, a Japanese cruiser was the first to fire a torpedo at the ship that, ugh, that the Sullivan brothers and also my ancestor that was on the USS Juno with them. This sub sunk that cruiser that fatally wounded the USS Juno. And as you can see, in this sub, it is really, really cramped. That is exactly why I said there are headbangers and knee knockers. And as you look here, here are the engines for this bad boy. As you know, this is a diesel sub. But, as you can see, and you're hearing the little intercom thing in the background, all this stuff is connected. That is why all these ships are here. And I gotta tell you, it's an incredible story. Why let it end? Why let it stop here, huh? There's the thing, as I said, everybody. This sub sunk the ship that delivered the first torpedo strike against the USS Juno. As it says in that picture, it was the Japanese cruiser IJN Nagara. And judging by the looks of it, that was, a, that was an old-fashioned Tonryu class light cruiser with the three funnels. And you, the, you World of Warships players should know that as the Japanese tier... Three? Tier 3? I think it's Tier 3. Tier 3 light cruiser in the Japanese tech tree. But, again, everything has a story. And it's so hard to believe that all of these... All these ships... They're here for a reason. And that reason is to preserve history. This connection that lasts so long. It lasts a lifetime. Incredible. So, folks, as I sign off for this video... I cannot stress enough that let's help the USS The Sullivans. Kelly Sullivan showed so much spirit in this ship because it represents her grandfather and his brothers. I take pride in this ship too. Being a member of the Sullivans division, or should I say former member now, this ship is one of the proudest serving in the Navy, that I must say. There are many ships that have been restored to fully operational status, though they are not a part of the Navy anymore. 
Let's do something with the Sullivans. Let's help them out. Let's help this beautiful, unique service ship out. Tell me in the comments what you think we should do. I think we should fully restore this ship to absolute glorious status again. Let's see it move. Let's see it sail. Show its pride and colors for all those who never made it back from the Second World War alive. For all those who sacrificed their lives to defend freedom around the world. And especially, let's give the old girl a chance and let's help out her big relative here, the Little Rock. Let's help them all out. I sign off for this. I am the tank commander. And make sure that you hit that subscribe button and get the bell for notifications. And remember to like this video and share it with anybody you can. And for those of you who are curious, go on the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park website if you want to help donate. I'm not doing this because I'm doing my own donations. I'm doing this to get a representation out there. Let's all help this wonderful World War II icon become even more one of a kind. Until then, until the next time, I am the Tank Commander, and I shall see you guys in the next one. Booyah!